What is the problem that Islam defines as central in the world, and what is the solution? Well, the problem is pride, or self-reliance. The idea that you can somehow make your way through life and into the afterlife without God. That we humans are self-sufficient in some way. And of all the religions in the world, it emphasizes that notion the most. It really presses the distinction between God and human beings. And so the solution then to that is to submit to God. And Islam actually, sometimes people say Islam means peace, and it, it is related to the, to the Arabic word for peace, but it actually means submission. So the idea is, is that we're prideful, we want to pretend we can exist just perfectly well without God, but what we really need to do is to submit to God. And if we submit to God through techniques like the five pillars of Islam, which include prayer five uh, times a day, um, where you get down on your hands and knees and you press your forehead into the ground. Mm-hmm. It's a your very submissive God. position. Yes, exactly. That that uh, if you do that, you will be with God in this life, and you will make your way uh, with God or Allah in in the afterlife into paradise. Mm. Are there other aspects of the technique for submitting to God? You talked about the five pillars of Islam. Are they all part of the technique? Yes. The way the way to be a Muslim is very simple. Uh, and this is a missionary religion like Christianity and like Buddhism. The core is called the Shahada, which is the testimony. I testify that there is no God but God and Muhammad is the messenger of God. If you say that and you say it sincerely and ideally in the presence of other Muslims, that makes you a Muslim and that sets you on the path toward paradise. But along with that, first of the five pillars are these four other pillars. And I like to think of them literally as pillars because that's the metaphor we get from the tradition with the shahada as the sort of what's holding up the center of the dome maybe. And then the four corners of the building are these four other of the five pillars. And the first is prayer. And we've already mentioned that, prayer five times a day. And this is a prescribed form of prayer, both in terms of the words and in terms of even the body postures. Um, The second is Charity, Uh, this is something that we don't hear about all that much in the West, but it's giving to the poor, essentially. Um, There's a real emphasis in Islam on what in Christianity is called the preferential option for the poor in liberation theology. Um, And you give not a portion of your income, but a portion of your assets every year to help the poor. The next pillar is fasting, and we hear about this particularly in Ramadan, the month of fasting in Islam, where from sun up to sundown you you don't eat you don't drink you don't smoke you don't you don't have sex and then the the, the last and sort of probably most visible in the world is the hajj the pilgrimage where muslims are obliged if they have enough money uh, because this is expensive to go to saudi arabia and to mecca where they stand and observe and participate in key moments in the life of the of the prophet uh, muhammad and experience as Malcolm X did when he went as a neophyte Muslim to Mecca, the unity of the Muslim tradition where the distinctions of Muslims of language and and dress are sort of wiped out and everybody feels that participation in the Muslim community Mm -hmm. together. So those are the ways to paradise and to submission to God. And you say in your book, God is Not One, that Muhammad is really different from the founders of other world religions in many ways. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's it's hard to overestimate the authority that uh, Muhammad had in the in the Islamic tradition, and that he continues to have. Because not only was he the vessel for bringing revelation into the world, and and the parallel here would be the Virgin Mary in Christianity, where the Virgin Mary is the vessel for bringing the revelation of God, the Logos and Word of God, Jesus, into the world. Here, Muhammad is the is the vessel for bringing that into the world. And like Mary is, is you know, pure and said to be without sin and conceived Jesus without having sex, uh, Muhammad is, is said to be illiterate. And so there's a sort of a miracle at the beginning uh, for Muhammad. But not only is he, is he that kind of charismatic figure starting off the tradition like a founder and bringing the scripture into the world, he's also a political and a uh, social leader and he's a military leader. So he's, he's a lawgiver. He's a judge. He's, he's a governor of sorts and he's a general in, in the military. So he plays the roles 
that in Christianity are played by Jesus and Paul in the first instance, and then later on by Constantine, who is the person who spreads the tradition. But Muhammad spreads the tradition himself during his own lifetime. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I think he's the most influential of all the, of all the religious um, leaders in the world. And let, let's move on then to some other key concepts in Islam. Muslims call God Allah. How is their vision of God different from those of, say, the other Abrahamic traditions, Christianity or Judaism? Well, I think it's closest to Judaism. And the way I like to describe it is as a kind of a strict monotheism or a hard monotheism where Christianity says there's one God, but it tolerates the ambiguity of having a human being who becomes God or who is God, who takes human form in, in Jesus. So you have these three persons, which seems to be, to Muslims at least, a violation of the notion of monotheism. And so Muslims are much stricter about their monotheism. In this sense, they're closer to Jews, where you have in Judaism the prescription against, say, graven images and imaging God. You have that prescription against imaging God also in Islam. And so you don't have the traditions that you have in Christianity, say, of depicting Jesus in art. You have a, a, a tradition of calligraphy, where what is going to make it into art from the religion is are the words of the Quran. So people using beautiful Arabic script to render the truths and the beauty of the Quran. But God is different from human beings. And, and what Muslims really focus on is maximizing that distinction. Don't confuse the human being with God. And that's part of this idea to go back to submission, that you need to submit to God. You need to not confuse yourself with God. And to confuse yourself with God is a, a, really a form of idolatry. Let me add just one more thing about God. There is this idea in Islam of God as being loving and merciful, but also being powerful and wrathful. And the tradition will talk about both of these things. And the Quran is really quite amazing on this score because you'll be reading on one page about how angry God is about the people who forget him. And then you read on another page about how merciful God is about the forgetters when they come back and remember and submit. So this, this tension between kind of love and beauty on the one side and power and uh, wrath on the other side is quite palpable in, mm. the, in the Muslim tradition. And you mentioned the Quran, which, of course, is the holy scripture of Islam. And you say it combines both law and spirituality. But I was interested in one, one sentence you used. You said it reads page after page like a fire and brimstone sermon. Yeah, I... <laughs> One thing I try to do in this book is is to just give voice to my own responses to these traditions. And one thing that really caught me as I was rereading the Quran to write God is Not One was just how much there is of the fire and brimstone, of the if you turn away from God, if you don't remember God, if you continue to forget God, you're going to be burning. And um, there really is a strong emphasis in the Quran on warning, you know, warning the evildoers, warning the people who have turned away. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, the carrot along with the stick, which is that paradise is this, you know, beautiful place of, of cool shade and comfortable couches and, and fruit and rivers, rivers of milk and of wine and of honey and of water. It's really big in terms of the, re the rewards and the punishments. Mm. You also emphasize something I think that the average American probably doesn't know, that a persistent theme in the Quran is justice and poverty, this preferential option for those who are weak. Well, you know, this is one theory about how the tradition spreads. Muslims really give up on, on the rich. You know, there's a, a really strong criticism that the rich are just oppressing the poor all the time and that Allah is on the side of the poor. And this is really clear from the Quran. It's really clear also from the secondary scripture, the Hadith, which records the sayings and the, and the exemplary life of Muhammad, that um, God is on the side of the poor. And this is one reason why one of the five pillars is to, is to give to the poor. And this is one reason why so many people in, in world history have flocked to this tradition, which is now second in importance in terms of numbers behind, uh, behind Christianity. And you say, of course, that Islam is growing. It's the fastest growing religion in the 21st century. Do you think that's what's behind that growth? I think that's part of it. 
It's growing also because of this idea that, you know, God has spoken and, and there is this revelation in the Quran, and it's not corrupted in the same way that the Tanakh of Judaism is corrupted or that the Bible of uh, Christianity is corrupted. What do you mean when you say they're corrupted? You know, we don't have the earliest texts. We have a different texts that, that say different things and they've been translated in, in different ways over time. And uh, we just can't really trust the Bible in the way that we can we can trust the Quran, which, by the way, in the, in the Islamic tradition, is only scripture in Arabic. It's really interesting in America with the Bible. Nobody really wrings their hands about, gosh, we, we can't read the real Bible because we can't read Hebrew and we can't read Greek. You know, we sort of feel mm-hmm. like, hey, we have the Bible. Um, but in Islam, you really have to have it in Arabic in order to have have the real text. Sharia law. We hear a lot about it. What is it? Why is it important? Well, Sharia just means law, and it refers to uh, it refers to the idea that in Islam, you're told not just here's a scripture, not just here are some methods for personal spirituality, but you're told you know here's the right path, you know here's the here's the way to have a society. Um, w- one distinction between Islam and Christianity is that Islam legislates family life, social life, economic life political life. It tells you how to deal with criminals. It tells you how to deal with taxation. It tells you how to deal with interest. It's a body of law that is rooted in the Quran and rooted in this secondary literature called the Hadith and then rooted in a series of of legal decisions that were done by by various jurists. And, um, you know, it's like the the rabbinic tradition in Judaism where you have we have rabbis who who argue about, you know, okay, what, what's halakha here? Like, what's, what are we supposed to do legally as Jews? And in this sense, Islam, again, is closer to Judaism than it is to Christianity because Christians aren't told, you know, this is what you should eat. This is how the state should be run, right? I mean, there is more in Christianity of this, like, give to Caesar what Caesar's, give to God what is God's. Um, there isn't a church-state distinction in Islam or a mosque state distinction. And so the tradition is going to tell the state how it should do its work. And this is, of course, very controversial throughout the Muslim world because there are states that have Muslim majorities that certainly don't, in fact, most of them don't follow uh, Sharia law. They don't try to create a state that is really perfectly purely Islamic in the way that the Taliban, say, is trying to do. Of course, it has its own you know, reading, reading of the law of Sharia. So that's what it is. And it points to the idea that this is a tradition that is really about the whole life of the, of the person, the personal life, the public life, the political life. And, of course, you alluded earlier to Sunnis and Shias. Why the split? Well, it starts off early on. It starts off uh, over after the death of Muhammad. And the question is basically, what kind of successor are we going to have? How much power will the successor have? And the key thing was, is it going to have to come from the bloodline of Muhammad or not? And the people who insisted on on the bloodline uh, went with Ali, the prophet's son-in-law, and they became the Shia or the so-called partisans of Ali, which is what Shia Ali means or Shia. And then the other side said, no, we need to go with sort of the, the best available person. And the key moves really are, are two. One is how much authority do you invest in the successor to Muhammad or, or the uh, imam or the caliph or whatever you're going to call the, this leader. And the Sunni invested social and political authority but not religious authority. The religious authority was decentralized in the community. What the community decided would go. On the Shia side, they invested the religious authority in the imam, in this sort of pope-like ayatollah sort of, sort of figure. Um, and, and the other piece that was really important and became important particularly in the 20th century is martyrdom. There's important traditions of martyrdom among the Shia that go back to the, the uh, martyrdom of the grandson of Muhammad Hussein in the year 680 um, in Iraq, in Karbala. And there's a memory, a powerful memory of that among the Shia that, that motivates uh, Shia to, to move toward a kind of martyrdom. And uh, that has been manipulated in the 20, 20th and 21st century to, to motivate martyrdom in the name of Islam and even terrorism and suicide bombings and, and, and things like that. So that, that's part of the distinction between those two, two traditions.